Today we're going to talk about how to warp, how to wind out a warp for a tape loom, uh, either with warping pegs uh, or with a warping board if you happen to have one. Um, we're going to warp both a regular tape loom like this and the treadle tape loom. As you can see here, I've got several yarns. Uh, most 18th century tape um, that has survived was woven with linen thread. And this is the closest weight in commercially available today. It's 16.2. Uh, this is Bakken's, and there are several online retailers that sell it. Um, and then uh, if I'm weaving projects for modern uh, tape for modern projects, I use a cotton thread. The weight I use is usually 8.2 or 10.2 cotton, or the equivalent in cotton. Um, so as you can see here, we've got the table set up with warping pegs. Uh, if you don't happen to even have warping pegs or a drill press to make your own, you can even use ladder back chairs like this to improvise um, warping pegs. Uh, you'll see the principle though as I go along. Basically you want a cross um, or a cross and then you warp around another peg at the end. Um, and the cross maintains the order of your threads. Now you can either wind all the colors of one, you know, all the threads of one color and then all the threads of another color and then warp them in the order you want them. Or you can uh, wind each thread in the order um, that it goes, regardless of color. And it doesn't matter. I've warped my big loom both ways. I made some um, hand towels that were a plaid and I warped each color and then um, threaded the, uh, the loom um, in the order of the color that I wanted. Um, so it's, it's your preference. Right. So the thing that establishes the order of the threads that you are winding is these two pegs. Um, you could, if you're doing a ladder back chair, eliminate this and do your cross here. But I like a three peg setup because sometimes it gets a little muddy if you've only got two pegs. So I'm going to cross here wind around this peg and come back and cross in the other direction here. Then take the next color that I need tie it onto the first peg cross remember in the opposite direction from the last one you did so you have these stacked crosses and then again cross in the other direction and keep going until you've wound out all the warps that you want all right, so you can see that I've got pegs all the way around the table, and this is so that I can get a longer warp. So I've actually undid what I just did, and then I'm going to show you how I'm gonna use the whole table to get a longer warp. Um, if you, uh, other ways I've done this is to put a chair at the other end of the kitchen, or if I'm out at a reenacting event, I'll put the tape loom over here, use that for warping, and put a stick or peg or chair, you know, as many yards away as I want the warp to be. And if you wear a pedometer, you're getting your steps in for the day. All right, I've finished um, warp, winding my warps, and you can see I've got a nice cross here that maintains the threads in the color order that I want them. Um, and I am going to preserve that cross. If you were weaving on a big loom, you would tie a thread around the cross if that's what you want. 
you can do that here too, especially if you're doing it at a reenacting event. But I'm just going to use um, a couple of popsicle sticks and a rubber band to save this. I'm going to use these as kite sticks. If you've done weaving on a big loom, um, usually they'll have you tie the warp off at intervals so that it doesn't get tangled. Another method of uh, winding, off your, uh, winding your warp is to use kite sticks and wrap the warp around those instead. Uh, it saves time, um, and I've found that even, uh, even weaving on a big loom, if I use kite sticks to hold the threads in order, I don't really need to use those ties, at least not very much. Depends on the project. Some yarn's unrulier than others. So I'm going to do an overhand knot like this. Well, it's not really a knot, it's a loop. And then wind my warps onto this stick. Now you can use a kite stick like this, or you can use a spare shuttle. Works just as well. So this is what I'm doing instead of chaining the warp. All right, now I've come to the end here. I'm just going to cut this. And then we can warp the loom. Before uh, we go any further, I want to mention this book. Um, I'm not getting any money for this endorsement. This is probably the best book on 18th century and early 19th century tape that's out there. I was thinking of writing one myself, and then this one came out, and I was like, oh heck, you know, that's, I couldn't do any better. Now we're going to take that cross that we made earlier and put it onto your hand. So these, your hand will hold these threads as you are uh, putting the warp into the loom. So put your index finger through the front of the cross and your pinky through the back. And now you can take your sticks out, or the thread if you're using a thread, and you can see how this lies in your hand and preserves those threads in the order that you wound them out. Um, to warp the loom, since you don't have a slaying hook as you would on a big loom, uh, you can use um, I think Susan Weaver uses the little dental things. I use a blunt tapestry needle to warp the loom. I have marked the center uh, slot on this loom with a little uh, pencil mark. So now I'm going to count over 10 spaces, counting each slot and hole as an individual space. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this thread, this is a 20 thread warp, so I need ten. If it was a 16 thread warp, I'd count over eight. So then you can see how the cross preserves the order. This um, thread goes into the hole. I finished threading the threads through the heddle. And now I'm going to simply tie, uh, this is an actual overhand knot, here. Even up all the ends, make sure you're not missing any. I've got a string around the um, warp beam here. I'm just going to tie this here. And then I can start winding. I'm going to maintain tension with my hand. Oops, there we go. So now I am going to even up these ends and cut the end. and then tie a knot, and this will be the start of my tape. Now I need to wind on some thread on this shuttle. Now these are netting shuttles. These are some period examples, and this is one that I made. And 
the way these are um, yeah, threaded is you hold it with your hand and use your thumb to guide that thread over the little tongue here and then down around the bottom. Flip it, use your thumb, flip it, use your thumb, flip it, use your thumb. And you keep doing that until you've got as much thread on your shuttle as you need. A good number of period tape looms have a hole in the back. And if you look at the portrait of Mrs. Mifflin weaving, which is one of the few portraits we have showing one of these looms in use, you'll notice that the back of her loom is tied with a large silk ribbon to a table. So what I'm gonna do is tie this to the stretcher of my table here. And this keeps the loom from too, pulling too far forward and allows me to have decent tension on the tape as I weave. This little tape loom is a replica of a Pennsylvania German loom. This is a pretty typical Pennsylvania German style. Um, it's got a little handle over here, but it does not have a ratchet and pawl. And we couldn't find any evidence of one when I uh, made the replica of the original. Um, what we think is that it ha was simply uh, the, the uh, warp beam was stopped from advancing by use of a stick. And that works pretty well, as you can see. So I'm starting to weave. You pull your knotted warp down, creates a little gap here, put the shuttle through there, draw it through. Now hold on to that tail, pull it up. You've got a gap in the opposite direction. Pull the shuttle down toward you, firm it up nicely, draw your selvages in. Unlike on a big loom, you want to draw those selvages in. You want it to be nice and tight. If you're getting wobbly, weak, um, tape, you probably don't have enough tension and you probably dr aren't drawing your, um, your thread tightly enough when you throw your shuttle. You'll, you'll notice that this band weaving uh, shuttle, you don't need a sharp edge to do this because you're not beating in a lot. Two more things. Uh, I usually set the loom up so that when I'm um, holding the thread down. I am throwing the shuttle to the left. And then when I hold it up, I'm throwing the shuttle to the right. And this way when I stop, if the th thread is coming out on the right, I know that I need to go down next. I know where I've stopped. And another thing is that if you want a gauge to gauge your thickness of your thread for consistency, you can take it a little note card or post-it note and use that as a, as a thickness gauge as you go um, so that you can either draw in more or less to maintain the thickness of the tape that you want. What I'm going to do now is show you how to use a regular warping board to wind out warp. What I'm going to show you now is how to use a warping board to wind out warp. Um, I'm going to demonstrate a period uh, check pattern in blue and white. It's one of the more common patterns. Um, this is a warping board I made myself. It's pretty easy if you've got a table saw and a drill press. Uh, the key points is that you want pegs so that you can wind your cross and the pegs need to be a yard apart. I've already started with a slip knot at the end. I'm gonna put this down here. Do over this peg, under this peg, and around down as far as many yards as I want. This is going to be a fairly long warp. Around that peg and then back.
So my two outside warps on this are white. Now again, I need to see which direction I crossed the last time I went through the cross and do the opposite with the next thread. Uh, as I did earlier with the uh, warping pegs, now we're going to wind this warp onto a kite stick and then move it over to the loom and warp it. Here's the cross. You can see it preserves the order of the threads. And I'm going to keep that with my coffee stirrers and a rubber band. And then I am going to wind this warp off using the kite stick again. So make a loop, put your kite stick through it, and then wind. and then snip off these ends and now we go to the loom. So I've got the cross on my hand again. This is an 18 thread warp. Uh, it's important to know how many threads you've got. Um, so I'm going to start at the middle, which again I have marked with a little pencil mark there, and count over nine spaces. and warp from there. So here's the middle. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, so I need to get that uh, needle warped, uh, I mean needle threaded, and then start warping from there. All right, so I've got the heddles threaded. Now something I forgot to say earlier was that because you've got two heddles here, unlike the other loom, you need to, if, if you're um, putting a thread through a hole in one heddle, it needs to go through a slot in the other heddle. And then if it's in the slot on one side, it needs to go in a hole, through a hole in the other side. These float a little bit, so that takes a little bit of fiddling with. Um, but it, you know, it, it, um, if it's in a hole through both, that's not going to slide past when you're um, changing the shed. Um, you know, switching heddles. All right, so I've evened up all the ends here. And again, I'm going to do this little loop and then tighten that over the knot that I made. Back that out a little bit and slowly wind this on. These are coffee stirrers. I got them at the craft store. I'm going to put one on either side of the knot to smooth that bump out a little bit and then keep rolling. Now on 18th century looms that have survived with their original warp, they would use rye straw, little pieces of rye straw stuck into the warp the same way. So every few rounds I'm going to stick a couple of these in. And that just keeps the layers of warp from building up into bumps, which would cause you problems with your tension down the road. So as I've been winding this on, I've been kind of combing these threads out with my hands. We've come to the end. So what I'm going to do here is cut these threads so that it's even. Back that back a little bit. Now this thread comes from the warp beam. It's to go under this front roller. And then here, I'm going to divide the warp in half. Put both halves through this loop. Oh, 
crazy. Tie and then use both ends to tie a square knot. So over this way. I've got pretty good tension here. Don't you don't want any really loose ones or really tight ones. And then the other direction, get all your ends. You've got a little square knot here. Now I can start weaving. And now we bring this all together. Um, I've advanced the warp so that it's about that far in front of the roller. Um, your sweet spot for weaving on this loom is from about here to here. Um, and the advantage of a loom like this is because you've got both a warp beam and a cloth beam, it holds the tension for you um, with these ratchets and pawls, you know, so you don't have to constantly be leaning back to maintain your tension as you do with the other loom. Um, you can see this is my favorite spot for my coffee uh, mug. Um, so anyway, I'm going to start here. And again, I'm pressing with my right foot and throwing the shuttle to the right and pressing with my left foot and showing throwing my shuttle to the left. So if I stop, I know where I am. When you're all done with your tape, um, they were frequently either made into a bundle or a ball or sometimes wound onto little winders like this. So when I saw the pictures that someone posted of these in the Facebook group for tape looms, I went in the shop and made myself some and they're very handy. So those are the basics of how to warp your tape looms and your netting shuttles and I hope you have a lot of fun weaving and using your tape on your projects.